never seen such bright lights before. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Malta Study Center and the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, I want to welcome you to the opening of our exhibition, Knight's Memory and the Siege of 1565, an exhibition on the 450th anniversary of the Great Siege of Malta. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Daniel Gulo, and I'm the curator of the Malta Study Center at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, which is, uh, for those of you who are new to the campus, is now currently located somewhat inside and somewhat alongside Alcuin Library at uh, St. John's University. Uh, we're currently celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we will be having events throughout the year uh, discussing particular aspects of our collection, uh, collections which uh, encompass over 500 libraries worldwide. Um, and it is my hope that you will be able to attend all of these events throughout the year. Um, if you have not seen our exhibition, uh, it will be running at HMML until October 3rd. Uh, so please come by and visit. And if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to stop by my office. I'm more than willing to take the time uh, to share the collection with you. Um, now, before I turn over the podium to our speaker tonight, uh, I want to acknowledge several people whose work and efforts have made this exhibition a po possible, several of whom are uh, presently in, in the room tonight with us. Um, I want to take an absentia, thank in absentia Ms. Lenore Rouse, the curator of the rare books at the Catholic University of America, and also Dr. Marguerite Ragnow, who is with us here tonight, who's the curator of the James Ford Bell Library, for lending, li lending items for our exhibition. So this is a really wonderful opportunity to see several items from around the United States collected in one uh, one spot here in Collegeville. Uh, I want to extend special thanks to uh, uh, Miss Margaret Borg uh, of the Bell Library and Tim Turnace of HMML, who exchanged several emails and helped us arrange for the loans and the transportation of these books uh, to our collection um, and exhibit here uh, at HMML. Um, uh, allow me also to actually ex extend my thanks to um, Matt Heitzelman, the curator of the Austria-Germany Center and Rare Books and Manuscripts for helping me uh, curate the collection here uh, for us uh, in our library. Um, one small last, I feel like I'm at the, uh, the Oscars a little bit, but one small <laughs> last <laughs> bit of thanks uh, to Wayne Torborg, Rachel Witt, Eileen Smith, uh, William Straub, and Julie Dietman, whose work on the catalog and helping arrange for these events uh, helped this turn out to be a, a really wonderful event for me as my first curated exhibit um, on a professional level. Um, finally, I want to thank uh, Father Columbus Stewart for supporting the exhibition and working on the catalog during a very busy time in HMML's calendar. And on behalf of Mr. Joseph S. Mikolev, the founder of the Malta Study Center, who sends his regrets for not being here tonight, but personally wanted me to extend his uh, welcome to all of you on his behalf to enjoy this evening. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the evening, um, Dr. Emmanuel Budijic, who is a senior lecturer of early modern history at the Department of History and Faculty of Fine Arts of the University of Malta. Uh, his specialization is on the Order of St. John and in particular the history of the order during the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, Dr. Budijic is a member of the Board of the Studies of Hospitaller Studies and also co-coordinator of the Masters in Mediterranean Studies at the University of Malta. He serves as Vice President ex officio of the Malta University Historical Society and is a member of the Faculty of Fine Arts Committee for the Public Understanding of the Humanities in Malta. There's uh, several wonderful uh, tasks he's undertaken. Um, he began his career um, early, and he read for his first degree. I like saying that because it's a very British way of announcing that somebody has completed a degree. But he read his first degree um, at the University of Malta, from where he graduated in the class of honors in 2002. And he later pursued his advanced degree work at the University of Cambridge, where between 2000 and, uh, 2004 and 2005, he, created, he completed his MPhil in early modern history, and then between 2005 and 2008, he completed his doctorate under the supervision of Dr. Dr. Mary Laven of Jesus College. Um, he's received numerous awards throughout his career, including major funding from the Commonwealth Trust and also funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council of England. 
Uh, he has published uh, an extensive uh, collection of essays and journals and books. Uh, his most major publications to date include Nobility, Faith, and Masculinity, The Hospitaller Knights of Malta, circa 1580 to 1700, published by Continuum of London and in New York in 2011. A paper called Knights, Jesuits, the Inquisition, and Carnival in 17th Century Malta, which appeared in the Historical Journal in 2012, published by the University of Cambridge. And a book of collected essays entitled Islands and the Military Orders, circa 1291 to 1798, co-edited with Dr. Simon Phil Phillips of the University of Cyprus, and published by Ashgate in England. Uh, Dr. Budigi's current research interest is focused on the urban rituals of the hospitalers engaged, that they engaged in during their stay in Malta. And he's looking at for ways in which public festivities, triumphal entries, were part of the language that the Order of St. John's was using to maintain the affection of the Maltese population on the one hand, and to continue to project in Europe an image of its utility in the fight against Islam on the other hand. His interest extend to public history, that is the way in which events come to be remembered in later times, and how the media contribute to this kind of recollection, of which we will be hearing a bit about this evening. His lecture tonight is entitled, The 1565 Great Siege of Malta, Knights, Maltese, and Memory. And I'd like to give a please warm welcome to Dr. Buttigieg. Good evening. I would like to start off by thanking the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library for having invited me to present this lecture. And I need to express a word of gratitude to Chevalier Joseph S. McAuliffe, the honorary consul and founder of the Malta Study Center, Father Columbus Stewart, the executive director of Himmel, Dr. Daniel Gullo, the Joseph S. McAuliffe curator of the Malta Study Center, communities of St. John's University and College of St. Benedict, and the monks of St. John's Abbey and the Sisters of St. Benedict. I feel very privileged to be here among you. In 2007, the popular magazine History Today carried on its front cover the catchy title, Keeping Turkey Out of Europe. The article in the magazine was about the Great Siege of Malta of 1565, but the title on the front cover was a clever, editorial tactic that was meant to play upon its readers' sensibilities with regards to a very sensitive issue in Europe, that is, the question of Turkish membership of the European Union. This example is but one of a long chain of such narratives that are inspired by this epic tale of violence, religion, and heroism, and then are adapted to a particular use. My lecture is called The 1565 Great Siege of Malta, Knight's Maltese Memory. And in it I will seek to illustrate how narratives about 1565 have been formed and reformed over time. So I shall start a brief overview of what happened during the Ottoman siege in 1565. I shall then move on to the main theme of the lecture, which is how the siege came to be remembered commemorated and interpreted in subsequent years by the Order of St. John. I will try to show how two objects in particular, the Philip II valet, sword, and, and dagger, came to feature very prominently at the heart of the memory of 1565. The tail end of the stalk will take a look at how 1565 was remembered after 1798, that's after the Knights left Malta, in the context of Malta having become a British colony, and more recently an independent state, and the current 450th commemoration happening just now. So let us begin by setting our bearings. And I need to ask you to make a leap, which is both spatial and chronological, from the very pleasant surroundings of this university, to the 16th century Mediterranean. We are particularly interested in the central Mediterranean, where the Maltese islands are located, a cultural and religious fault line between Europe and Africa for many centuries. There were two poles of power contesting each other in 1565, 
the Ottoman Empire, with its capital city of Constantinople, from where in 1565 a force some 20,000 strong was sent to attack Malta. And Malta, home to the Hospitaller Military Religious Order of St. John the Baptist, with a total defensive force of some 7,000 men. Now on the map I've also highlighted the island of Rhodes, which was the home of the Hospitallers until it was wrested away from them by the Ottomans in 1522. So one gets a feeling that both sides viewed the siege of Malta in 1565 as that moment of reckoning, the moment when the unfinished business of 1522 could be seen to. And these are the Maltese islands, and our focus will be on the main harbour region. This is how it looks today. As you can see, very urban. Uh, Valletta is the capital city, accompanied by the other cities, Floriana, Birgus, Anglia, Cospicua. They're underlined. This is where the action that we'll talk about today occurred. But for our purposes, we need to peel away for 150 years of developments and imagine an area very barren. There was only Birgu and Senglea. Valletta was not there. And there was only a very small fortress, St. Elmo, at the tip of the harbor. That's all. So it's this very confined space within which the action of 1565 unfolded. The 16th century Mediterranean was the arena where a great struggle between two mighty empires unfolded, Spanish and Ottoman. In the east, the Muslim Ottoman Empire and their Suleiman the Magnificent sprawled over the Balkan Peninsula, Asia Minor, and much of the Arab world. In the west, the Spanish Catholic Habsburg Empire of Charles V and Philip II um, spread on the other side. So against this backdrop, Malta featured quite prominently in the Mediterranean order of things. Its position between Italy and Africa made it the object of dispute between Christians and Muslims, particularly as pressure intensified from both sides to assert effective control over North Africa. Therefore, when thinking about the siege of Malta of 1565, it only really makes sense when we see it part as part of a chain of conflicts from the um, late 15th century to the third quarter of the 16th century. There's a, this list is unfolding just to give you a sense that it's not an isolated event. It's part of an ongoing clash and movement between these two powers. It's a very dynamic canvas. Moving on to the siege itself, this stretched from mid-May to mid-September of 1565. The Ottoman attacking force was placed under the command of two men, Mustafa as commander of the army and Piali as commander of the fleet. For a while, they were joined by a formidable warrior known as Dragut, who took over the running, the running of the campaign until he was killed in action in mid-July. As stated earlier, the invasion force was about 20,000 strong. The leader of the Hospitallers and the Maltese was Grandmaster Jean de Vallette. Along with some 600 Hospitallers, there were another 6,400 soldiers and what we can call a civilian population of some 10,000 men, women and children. In a siege situation, when a city is surrounded by the enemy, no one is safe and everyone must contribute. And the sources do speak of Maltese women and children playing a role in defending their cities against the Ottoman attack. After a grueling conflict for both sides, on 8 September, the Ottomans lifted the siege, and on the 12th, they departed. It was finally over. So what was the significance of this event? Well, it has to be said that for Europe and the Mediterranean, it did not really change things that much. But for the order and for Malta, 1565 signaled the commencement of a new confident phase in their history. The allure of the siege provided the order with many admirers and sponsors, and it also cemented the ideal of the soldier of Christ within its own ranks. A map of Malta 
which you see here, was included among the charts depicted in the gallery of maps inside the Vatican Palace. Above the island, there is a sword-wielding angel with the eight-pointed cross of the order on its chest. It carries a book with the inscription, Malta freed from the siege. As a bastion of Christendom, Malta's purpose within the iconography of the gallery of maps was to stand as a reminder of one of the Catholic Church's greatest victories over Islam. And this is an early example of how the siege came to have many manifestations and interpretations. In a sense, there was a narrative for everyone. This brings us to the core part of this talk. How was a key event like 1565 remembered, commemorated, and interpreted in subsequent years? And here I will refer to the ideas of two prominent social psychologists, James H. Liu and Dennis J. Hilton, and their concept of historically significant charters. In their definition, a charter is any event or object which helps to create a dialogue between the present and the past. It helps to define the timeless essence of a group. Therefore, adopting this concept, the siege of 1565 and the Philip II Valet sword and dagger can be seen as charters. They became fundamental elements in sustaining a cohesive hospitaller Maltese island order state. I shall be looking at early modern Malta from the perspective of rituals and memory focused on the siege of 1565. Rituals need to be seen as central elements in the sustenance of the island order state. In this vein, the victory of 1565 against the Ottoman Empire provided a much needed material for a memory of triumph that the order would develop in subsequent decades. In remembering the events of 1565, through the regular display in official events of significant objects, such as the sword and dagger which Philip II gave to the valet, the order restated its continuing relevance. Public opinion, if we can use that term, was asked to participate in such rituals, to accept the social representation of history which legitimated that particular social and political arrangement. The order developed its emblems and ceremonies so that hospitalers and non-hospitalers could participate as magnificently as possible in venerating the dead, honoring their leaders, and celebrating their heroes. The victory of 1565 was soon followed by triumphal imagery that was meant to mortalize this episode and its heroes. And this needs to be understood in the context of Malta, where a whole new urban node was developed practically from scratch, centered on Valletta, but also uh, all around it. The creation of this new urban fabric from the late 16th century onwards fostered the space, administrative, economic, cultural, religious, and communal, where the Order of St. John and the inhabitants of Malta could lead their lives. Therefore, in trying to identify the workings of memory in the island order state, it is essential to bear in mind the conditions of urban life and the responses to these. Moreover, the order lost no time in propagating its success over the Ottomans through both textual and visual means. In particular, the decision to decorate the walls of the Hall of the Great Council, which we see here, in the palace of the Grand Master in Valletta, exclusively with the theme of 1565, suggests a deliberate and conscious decision to ensure the mortalization of this pivotal turning point. There were many glorious episodes the order could have opted to depict in this large and important room in the Grand Master's Palace, but the choice was made to remember 1565. Publications, paintings, and architecture were important in fostering the memory of the siege, but it was through rituals, which involved a range of people, certain significant objects, and a number of key locations, that the order not only commemorated past achievements, but also laid out the prospect of further initiatives. The streets and waterways of Valletta were envisaged not only in military terms, but also to serve as stages for urban ceremonial. Now, when we examine the iconography of early modern Valletta, it is possible to detect two processes at work. 
First, there was an attempt to impart a memory and a sense of the corporate existence of the city to the predominantly migrant population as part of the process of socializing them to urban life. In the nature of things, this was a never-ending process. A second purpose was to legitimize the authority exercised by the ruling elite. We might term this historicized memory. In developing a historicized memory, the island order state in Malta made regular recourse to the events of 1565 as the building block, soaked by the blood of hospitaler martyrs, upon which the early modern hospitaler Maltese polity was built. Over time, a sophisticated interplay between space and ritual developed. This is because, while the urban fabric of Valletta may seem reassuringly permanent, it was and will always be in flux, which means that the setting for rituals in the early modern period was variable. Over the decades, a number of places around the harbor developed an association with the memory of 1565. Let's look at a few of them, starting in Valletta. A indicates the chapels of St. Anne in Fort St. Telmo, where, to cite a document of 1779, quote, the remains of the champions who spilled their blood in the defense of that same castle during the siege of the Turk rest, unquote. B is the great hall in the palace of the Grand Master to which we have already referred, which depicts lauded highlights from the siege. C is the conventual church of St. John the Baptist, the main church of the order, which has a memorial in the churchyard to the fallen of 1565, as well as having depictions of certain individuals who died in the, sea, in the siege on, on its vault as heroes, as martyrs. D is the Hospitaller Church of Our Lady of Victory, the first church to be built in Valletta, commonly associated as a memorial to the victorious outcome of 1565 and the original resting place of De Valette prior to the building of St. John's. Moving to Birgu, E indicates Fort St. Angelo, where the following inscription is found, quote, Around the cemetery which covers the ashes of those who died in the Turkish siege of 1565, the captain of this garrison piously set a railing in 1787." Unquote. E, the main square in Birgu, where one had the watchtower from which it is said that De Valette kept a lookout during the siege and a monument built in 1705 to commemorate the siege. And finally, G, the chapel of Our Lady of Damascus, wherein were kept a sword and a hat considered to have belonged to Grand Master de Valette. So in pinpointing these locations, one comes to see how the urban fabric of the harbor area was infused with historical memory and significance. And so it is against that palimpsest that the rituals of the island order state unfolded. Of particular significance was the annual feast of 8 September as Victory Day. One object in particular, the sword and matching dagger given to De Valette by Philip II of Spain was at the heart of such events. According to Marius Quint, objects serve memory in three main ways. Firstly, they furnish recollection. They constitute our picture of the past. Secondly, objects stimulate remembering to bring back experiences which otherwise would have remained dormant, repressed, or forgotten. And thirdly, objects form records, analogues to living memory, storing information beyond individual experience. Entering us through the senses, they become history, like the fragments that speak to the paleontologist or geologist. Now, according to René Dea, the sword bears a strong resemblance to four other precious gift swords which the Habsburgs gave to particular monarchs. So it was a kind of trend. The sword and dagger were given by Philip II of Spain to de Valette in 1566, so one year after the siege. De Valette, in turn, he didn't keep them, he passed them on to the order, turning a personal gift with 
could have political implications into a collectively owned object that would transcend time and space in its capacity to furnish recollection, stimulate remembering, and form a record. It was decreed that as part of the annual procession during the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, which was instituted in 1566 to remember the day when the Ottomans had withdrawn, the sword and dagger would be carried in front of the Grand Master by the most favored magistral page, preferably the son of a prince or great lord. This is the document instituting this. Now, the sword and dagger do not fit a strict definition of a relic, that is, that they should belong to a holy person. But over time, they did acquire the trappings of institutional or state relics. A relic could be used as a material manifestation of the act of remembrance, as well as an instrument of legitimation of authority. And this is precisely what happened to these objects. During the funeral of Davalet himself, at every 8 September celebration, as well as on other occasions when these objects were publicly displayed. 8 September was both a civic ritual and a religious feast. It was there to indicate the order's primacy among the community and its role as defender of the faith. Now, we can see that the sword rapidly accumulated cultural capital from an incident in 1581, so just over two decades uh, after they had arrived in Malta. In 1581, a number of hospitalers, led by Romegas on that side, revolted against the Grand Master, Lacassier. They removed him from power. The Pope, in response, sent to Malta as his envoy, Cardinal Gaspare Visconti. He was to look into things. Significantly, on 8 September, Cardinal Visconti decided to postpone the procession with the sword and dagger, and thereby rejecting the idea that Romegas, the leader of the revolt, should carry them instead. The wielding of this object clearly enhanced the bearer's claim to authority, something which Visconti decided to avoid in those circumstances. Much later, in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte and the forces of the French Republic invaded Malta and unhinged the Hospitaller Island orders there. The sword and dagger were taken away by Napoleon. Today, they reside at the Louvre, which is still a sore point for many in Malta. Nevertheless, impressions of the sword and dagger have survived on the island. For instance, we've got this 17th century painting which shows us a procession in front of St. John's Conventual Church. So, so this is the main church of the order. There's a procession going in front of it, and there's a particular detail which interests us. Because in this detail, we see the Grand Master, the standard bearer, and the page who is carrying, if you make it out, the sword and the dagger. This is what it would have looked like. We have another example from the Church of Our Lady of Victory, which I remind you was the first church of, in Valletta, where we have this nice chubby puto holding, once again, a representation of the sword and the dagger. It's again a reminder of how central they were in remembering 1565. And the next three illustrations seem to indicate the development of an iconographically popular image an almost standard way of depicting the page carrying the sword and the dagger. Became a bit of a postcard almost. Therefore, rituals commemorating 1565 ignited the meaning of the monumental structures that the order raised in Valletta. During such events, the appeal to the senses and the involvement of the community were essential to foster a sense of identity and belonging to the Hospital Maltese Island Order State. Over time, the hospitalers fostered a Maltese hospitaler landscape of objects and memories, which was constantly in flux and being retaught. In this process, the Valet sword and dagger came to occupy particularly significant roles. Charters, underwriting the island order state. Significantly, the sword and dagger were not objects to which the people were asked to go to. They were objects that went to the people because they were processed around the city. A movement enables an intellectual and emotional remapping of the urban space. As the sword moved about, 
It afforded the opportunity for people to observe it from multiple viewpoints and to relate to it from different angles. As it passed through, it was meant to emphasize the link between past, present, and future, and the way this was embedded into the urban fabric and population of Valletta. The celebration of 8 September acted as the emotional reminder that the bond between the order, the Maltese islands and their people, went beyond ink and parchment and had been forged through the blood and sweat of battle. It was such elements that constituted the historicized memory of the island order state upon which the same polity depended. Now this polity, Hospital Air Malta, collapsed in 1798 as a result of the Napoleonic invasion. The downfall of Hospital Air Malta was caused by the overwhelming transformation of the Euro-Mediterranean political framework rather than any particularistic decline within the order. Malta itself, from the dawn of the 19th century, was now part of a new reality, the global British Empire. Within this new reality, the memory of 1565 would come to have a new significance. This time, as part of a developing nationalist narrative, as Maltese political consciousness in a British fortress colony developed over some 160 years. 1565, as a memory, retained its emotive power as a charter, but the context now was different. The significance that 1565 still holds in the Maltese national psyche is encapsulated in this huge monument, the Great Siege Monument in Valletta, which was inaugurated in May 1927. The erection of this monument was both the culmination of a process and the starting point of another. Since at least the last quarter of the 19th century, Maltese political leaders, advocating for Malta's cultural distinctiveness from Britain, and hence the right to political representation, had identified 8 September 1565 as Malta's National Day. A day, so they said, when Malta had saved Europe from the Turks. Now, the other against which the Maltese had to measure themselves were the British. This narrative culminated in the 8 September 1565 National Holiday Act of 1922. That is, once Britain had finally given in to the long-running request by Maltese political leaders to grant self-government in 1921, one of the very first acts by the first Maltese parliament was to pass a law setting up a national day and a national monument, centered on 1565. The symbolism is powerful and unmistakable. You've got a strong male figure in the center with sword and shield, flanked on the left by a female figure representing Christianity, Catholicism in particular, because she holds a papal tiara, and on the right by another female figure representing European civilization. She holds Minerva's head. In spatial terms, the monument lies at the heart of the capital city. In cultural terms, the 8 September celebration still holds pride of place in the national calendar. A speech has been read at the foot of this monument almost every year since 1927. A study of these speeches and the accompanying theatrical performances, which always seem to include uh, a flag-wielding maiden, would very probably serve as a barometer of national aspirations and issues as the island moves from being a fortress colony to political independence, economic transformation, and membership of the European Union. What concerns us here is how this siege at this moment in time has become deeply inscribed into Maltese national consciousness and manifests itself in a variety of ways. For instance, when the weather seems particularly odd, we in Malta say, Twilet Tork, a Turk has been born. We say this when, for instance, there's rain and the sun is out. That's odd. To give you another example, recently, in recent years, rugby has become popular in Malta, and the national team have adopted a uniform which recalls that of the Knights, and they have nicknamed themselves the Malta Knights. Soccer is, however, the most popular sport on the island, and here, too, memories of the night and of the siege 
can emerge. A great example was the 8th September 2007 UEFA football match between Malta and Turkey. The date of the match was, I think, a coincidence, but it fitted like a glove into local history and traditions. Images such as this one, showing supporters dressed in black shirts with white eight-pointed crosses, um, appeared across all the newspapers and social media. And such pictures possess the haunting feeling to them because they show the pervasive way in which the past continues to impinge on perceptions of the present. The Great Siege of 1565 may not have been the earth-shattering event that it was once thought to be, but in cultural terms, its memory has proved to be a very powerful molding force in Voltaire's consciousness and identity. Which brings us to the last part of this lecture, this year's 450th anniversary commemoration. If one looks for a frame of reference for how contested a commemoration can be, the example of France and its bicentennial commemoration in 1989 of the French Revolution of 1789 is an insightful example. Stephen Laurence Kaplan, a distinguished historian of 18th century France, published a two-volume work, Farewell Revolution, in which he tried to make sense of how France and her people had experienced the run-up to and the actual bicentennial. He argues in the introduction to his work, the bicentennial year was memorable for the bitterness and the passion the commemoration provoked, and for the inertia and indifference that it failed to overcome. It was memorable for the festive energy and imagination it elicited. It was memorable for what it revealed about the French sense of self, certitudes, anxieties, ambitions, conflicts, ambiguities. He added, the past, the present, and the future were inextricably commingled in the bicentennial experience. The 18th century received more public attention, however lacking in depth, than perhaps any time since the revolution itself. France strained to make sense of the revolution and its legacy. Some of these observations hold for Malta of today, Malta of 2015. Enthusiasm for the commemoration, generally described as a victory and a great one at that, has manifested itself in a variety of public activities as well as on social media. The Facebook page, The Great Siege of 1565 TV program, and its parallel Twitter account have garnered thousands of followers. From around March 2015, it has been possible to receive day-by-day -day updates through Facebook and Twitter of the preparations for the siege and the siege itself, much like today one would follow a current theater of war. Undoubtedly, some, possibly many, have remained indifferent. But I think at varying levels of consciousness, the commemoration of 1565 has touched most Maltese, and beyond Malta, many others too. Particularly when one notes that this 450th commemoration is happening in a very particular framework. Internationally, the years 2014 to 2018 have, and will continue to see, a range of activities to mark the centenary of the Great War. In Britain, for instance, this has been characterized by efforts to include various kinds of minorities in the narratives of the war and its commemoration. Whether such trends have had any influence on the Great Siege commemorations remains to be seen. At a local Maltese level, the years 2014 to 2018 are rather packed. They have and will continue to see a range of significant events. 2014 was the year of the national political um, anniversaries. And this went on like a roll call, day after day. 50 years of independence, 40 years of becoming a republic, 35 years since the closure of the British naval base, 10 years of European Union membership. The first three of these four political milestones are national days, of which Malta has five, and all four of these events were marked with extensive public state finance commemorations, as well as a range of private initiatives. 2015 has followed on from the year of national anniversaries as the year of the commemoration of 1565. 2016 will mark the 450th anniversary of the foundation of the city of Valletta. In 2017, Malta will, for the first time, take on responsibility for the presidency of the EU Council. 
and in 2018, Valletta will be the European capital of culture. The point I'm trying to make here is that the commemoration of the 450th anniversary of the Great Siege is not happening in a vacuum, but in a highly charged palimpsest of a small country in a globalized world that is both looking back into its past and peering into its future. Like the French self of 1989, the Maltese sense of self in 2015 is marked by certitudes, anxieties, ambitions, conflicts, and ambiguities. I am a historian of the 16th and 17th centuries, but I am also a citizen of today. A historical approach to the past acknowledges its complexity, whereas memory tends to simplify and be selective. There is therefore a tension between history and memory. And it is this dialogue, this tension between present and past, which I find particularly intriguing and fascinating. In this dialogue, 1565 is and will continue to be a charter to which Maltese and others will turn to again and again in the ongoing process of trying to figure out who we are, where we come from, and what we want to be. Thank you for your attention. Possible, I'd like to uh, offer the audience uh, some time now to take some questions for uh, Dr. Buttigieg, and I can field those for him in the future. That's a good question. Uh, of course, while they are in Malta, 1565 is the central event uh, because that happens on the island. Um, but um, from the early 17th century onwards, in a gradual manner, um, their earlier history also finds a space to be commemorated. So like the Palace of the Grand Master, if you go there, uh, there's a number of rooms and walls that are decorated with images that show earlier history. The knights in Jerusalem, for example, building uh, the fences or the knights on roads, the, their, their previous home. Um, and I, I think reflecting also trends across, across Europe, uh, an interest in the Middle Ages, so stories, uh, legends that the order uh, had been associated with also find themselves depicted again in buildings, palaces, churches uh, in, in Malta. Um, so certainly 1565, while being the, the focus or the main event, leaves space for others. But in a sense, it's all part of th this one same narrative ultimately, the, the glorification of the order, the utility of the order, um, and its legitimacy. That was a very important point. It has a legitimacy to what it has been doing for such a long time. Another question? Yes. I believe one of your uh, slides or something you said said that at that time, the population of Malta was, I forget the phrase, in flux or migrants or something that they were not sending here? Yes, I mean, when, when the hospitalers come to Malta in 1530, they find a very small population, maybe 20,000. Uh, with them, immediately, they bring some 3,000 Greeks that had been with them on roads. So, you know, suddenly there's another 3,000 at least plus hospitalers themselves. And because the order is in Malta, and because once it finds its feet, you know, it is a rich institution, ultimately, because it has all these lands and they have a lot of also corsairing, for which they get booty from Muslims, so that generates income. Malta does become a rich place gradually. 
and that attracts people to settle. And there's two kinds of migration happening. There's people from the Maltese countryside that move to the harbor because that's where the jobs are, that's where safety is. Uh, Malta comes to have one of the highest urban concentrations of Europe. Uh, I think at least 32% of its population is urban, which is really high by the standards of early modern Europe. And then you have lots of migrants from Spain, Sicily, southern Italy, Greece, uh, coming to Malta also for work. Many a times, we're talking mostly male migrants, women were more restricted. These male migrants tended to marry local girls and settle and become part of the community. Plus you also have a slave population, some of which were at some point or another, for some reason or another, freed. They would often convert, and some of them also marry locally, or they marry another ex-slave, uh, and they stay on the island. So, uh, and this is very constant throughout the whole period of the hospitalers. There's always a stream of people coming in, settling, intermarrying, and, and, and so on. Migration is, 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 a, is something that really shapes the character of, of early modern Malta. I mean, you go from those original 20,000 to about 100,000 in 1798. You know, that's a five-fold ex explosion of the population. And that just doesn't happen because just of internal procreation, as it were. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of migrants uh, ca coming in and shaping the character of the place. That's why I said it doesn't fit a strict definition of a relic, because uh, in my mind, a relic has to belong to a person who was declared holy um, and who died in some kind of manner that, that justifies uh, sanctity, as it were. That was not the case of Valet. But his role, his name, became so iconic over time that anything linked to him, and in particular the sword and dagger, acquire this tremendous status. So they become relics in the sense that they both are there to remind people of the valet and the siege, but they also legitimize the owner, which is the order of, of these objects. And that this is how I think about it as a relic, it has these two functions, which, which mo most relics do have. You know, they, they're there to rem remind us of someone and they're there also to legitimize someone or whoever holds that relic. So they are relics in that sense, the sense of remembrance and the sense of legitimization. That, that's, that's how I talk about it. And of course, uh, even in the Soviet Union, which was of course not, re not religious, you know, they, they kept the body of Lenin embalmed as a kind of relic. Um, so not holy, but it had a definition and a purpose within, within that context. That's a very good question as well. Um, so during the hospitaler period itself, of course you have moments of tension between the hospitalers and the local population. Um, but overall, I think it was a positive relationship because both sides benefited from it ultimately. Uh, the order had a good base, and the overall loyal population, the population had work and, and protection. So there was a lot of reciprocity there. Once the hospitalers leave and Malta becomes a British colony, um, I think there's two phases to the way we've remembered the, the hospitalers. 
Um, in the 19th century, up to the mid 20th century, very often the memory of the knights wasn't positive. Uh, the siege was remembered positively, but it was appropriated as a Maltese event. But the knights themselves were often used as a veil reference to the British. You know, you, put, you, you uh, depict these foreigners as evil, they had abused us in the past as your veiled criticism of the British in, in, the, in that situation. Um, in more recent times, I think since independence, so since uh, history itself on the island has developed and matured and moved away from being tied to these national narratives, um, the Knights have acquired, I think, a much more positive um, uh, feel to them. Um, and in recent years, there's been a lot of EU money also to restore their buildings and their legacy. So, you know, what previously used to be lots of grotty, darkened buildings suddenly now are beautiful and uh, light. Um, they bring a lot of money because of the tourists who want to come and see them. So I think in general, the memory of the Knights has been rehabilitated in, in, in a sense in, in, in more, more recently. It, it always reflects, of course, the particular circumstances of, of that moment. That's why I said memory is selective. Two questions, one simple. Who won the soccer match in 2007? <laughs> I presume the Turks, but... No, to, just to make it even better, it was a, a draw. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, there have been uh, people who ac you know, acquire these, idea, these these stories from the past and give them this this twist. So every now and then, particularly on the social media, because the mainstream media, I think, are very good at avoiding xenophobic uh, stories and, and, so, and promoting them in that sense. But the social media, there's no control. So every now and then, if something starts circulating on Facebook or Twitter, you know, on the lines of, right, 450 years ago, we stopped them, we saved Europe, now we need to do the same, you know. Um, and it attracts some attention, some following, um, but I think partly because overall the Maltese economy has been doing well in recent years, these narratives have not found that much roots. Um, and overall, I uh, think we've managed to keep a balanced perspective um, on, on things. Uh, but it's similar to these kind of narratives that you find in many other countries, you know, all the way up to Finland, no? the idea of new Templars forming uh, and, and so on. I again, it gives that simplistic narrative of you know, selective memory uh, rather than thinking of actually how complex thing things were. Because, you know, Malta was in a state of perpetual war against the Ottomans and the Muslims during the hospitaler period. But that didn't stop them trading uh, and exchanging goods and ideas. So the picture is always much more complex, really, when you, when you take the time to think about it a bit rationally, uh, as it were. But yes, uh, it, it, these, these narratives get used and abused. that, I would like to have a warm round of applause for our lecturer. <laughs> Thank you. And it's a small reminder that our exhibit does last until Friday, October 2nd, and please come down to our facility and our one-year-old facility and see these items, original documents from the period that have been collected. And, uh, and stay tuned for all of the rest of the events for our 50th anniversary this year at HMMS. Thank you. Thank you.